Welcome everyone to the final lecture series at the Center for Security, Race and Rights at Rutgers Law School in Newark, also known as the People's Electric Law School. My name is Sahara Aziz. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Security, Race and Rights and a Professor of Law and Chancellor of Social Justice Scholar here at Rutgers Law School. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure today to be hosting uh, one of my favorite scholars on race, uh, Professor Tanya uh, Katari Hernandez. Uh, but before I introduce her, and she will be presenting on her uh, famous book, uh, Racial Innocence Unmasking Latino Anti Black Bias, uh, I want to first encourage you to follow us on social media at RUCSRR on Twitter and Facebook and on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR. And if you are not already on our newsletter, please visit our website at csrr.rutgers.edu, uh, where you can add your name. And then finally, I just want to put a pitch for a new report that we just came out with at the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, which you can download on our website called Shining a Light on New Jersey's Secret Intelligence System. Uh, and in that report, we take a deep dive into the various and arguably nefarious ways in which our surveillance uh, system through fusion centers uh, may be violating our civil liberties. Uh, and so without further ado, I am extremely excited uh, to be introducing uh, a, a good friend, a colleague, and a former law professor at Rutgers Law School, uh, Professor Tanya Kateri Hernandez, who is currently the Archibald, Archibald Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law. Uh, professor Hernandez received her AB from Brown University and her JD from Yale Law School. She is a nationally and internationally known scholar on discrimination, Latin America and Latin American law, employment law, uh, critical race theory, and the science of implicit bias. Among her many accomplishments and publications uh, are uh, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equality, which was published by Beacon Press uh, this past August, 2022, and will be the center of her lecture and her comments today. And if you haven't purchased that book, I highly suggest that you do so today. She's also the author of the book, Multiracials and Civil Rights, colon, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination, and multiple book chapters about race and the law in Latin America. Uh, Professor Hernandez is also uh, the uh, author of the book, or excuse me, the article, The Buena Vista Social Club, The Racial Politics of Nostalgia in Latin, Latino Popular Culture, Sexual Harassment and Disparity, The Mutual Construction of Race and Gender, and um, Afro-Mexicans at the Chicano Movement, The Unknown Story, a review of Ian Henny Lopez's racism on trial, the Chicano uh, fight for justice. And so I, I could go on for quite a while in uh, reviewing her uh, scholarship, uh, but I want to save time for her to be able to discuss her exciting new book uh, today entitled Racial Innocence. And without further ado, I welcome Professor Hernandez to the virtual floor. Welcome, Professor Hernandez. Thank you very much, Sahad. It's very lovely to be with you here today. Um, I wouldn't, didn't want to be that person in the room who forgot to do unmute. <laughs> Um, shall I just jump right in? Okay, will do. Um, so uh, as I had to let everybody know, um, I'm Professor Tanya Hernandez, and I work at Fordham Law School. Uh, and I had two previous books um, that sort of led to this one. Um, so the two previous books uh, were Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination. So dealing with issues of sort of what's the rhetoric around uh, mixed race identity, uh, and how that gets deployed uh, both against people who are actually multiracial uh, and file lawsuits for discrimination um, and to what we need to think about and handle as far as civil rights is concerned. Uh, the other book uh, that is part of this uh, trilogy that I'm calling a trilogy on race um, was Racial Subordination in Latin America, uh, the role of the state customary law and the new civil rights response, uh, looking at how these same mixed race rhetorics 
um, are deployed against people of African descent in Latin America uh, in ways that um, try to undermine uh, the uh, movement for uh, having civil rights and social justice for all people uh, in Latin America, uh, and not just, uh, as I would say in India, the creamy layer. Uh, just the light skins. Uh, so uh, those two are sort of like the pillars that began my journey uh, to the book that uh, I'm here to discuss with you today, Racial Innocence, uh, uh, Unmasking uh, Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equality. Um, and, you know, this may seem like an unusual space for uh, Sahad and I to be having this discussion, um, but I think the reason why she invited me and why I was delighted um, to come join you all uh, today um, is because the sort of the case example um, of what I'm going to describe to you today about Latinos and Latinidad uh, really um, is much more expansive. Uh, that is to say that intra-community biases that we often um, are very, that, don't talk about that, that's taboo, et cetera, um, those undermine our ability actually to form coalitions um, and also our ability uh, to move forward the best interests of the entirety of our community, right? And not just those who already have light skin capital uh, and are able to navigate a, di a discriminatory world that, you know, for so many of us, um, but at the same time, um, intersectional perspectives matter greatly. Uh, and that is certainly the case within the Latino community. So first, uh, a little bit about, oh, and, and Todd, you give me a little signal if I'm going over my allotted time because <laughs> I do want to make sure we have time for a QA and a uh, from the audience and what have you. Much of what I say is often viewed as highly inflammatory and explosive. And so I imagine there might be some questions or commentary from the audience. Um, so part of the background that I want to just, you know, be very transparent about, um, you know, is that I and my family, we have skin in the game. That is to say, uh, we are Afro-Latinos. Uh, and that can be confusing to many people in the U.S. because when they think Latino, they think of it as something juxtaposed to other racial identities, Blackness in particular, uh, let alone Asian identity, Indigenous ancestry, and the like. Uh, when in point of fact, uh, Latinos are an ethnic group, a pan-ethnic group, in which we have Asian Latinos, Indigenous Latinos, Black Latinos, White Latinos, and those who may not have a racial identity but visually uh, are raced in each of these separate boxes and sometimes multiple all at the same time. Uh, with specific detail about the African ancestry that is my focus, uh, the transatlantic slave trade forcibly brought, historians say 90%, 90% of the 10.7 million slaves who survived, survived uh, the Middle Passage were brought to Latin America. Right? When we think about Las Americas, all of Latin, Latin America and North America, the disproportionate right? a slave trade is being brought to Latin America and the Caribbean. Right? Only 3.5% to what we now call the United States. All of which is to say that the legacy right, of slavery, both on phenotype, <laughs> uh, hair texture and the like, is quite remarked. Right? And it is not um, a anti an antique <laughs> from the past. Uh, and so the legacy of slavery is real and as are all the various uh, mechanisms uh, in law and extra legally uh, since the abolition of slavery uh, to maintain a racial hierarchy. One more detail about that, read volume one, which is Racial Subordination in Latin America, um, the earlier book that I wrote. But I bring that up because so often many people in my U.S. audience um, who are non-Latino, and even Latinos for that matter, don't have a racial literacy about this information. Right? Um, not, I'm not casting aspersions, saying people are ignorant. I'm saying we literally do not provide a racial literacy that is comprehensive you know, for so many populations, let alone Latinos and the Afro-Latinos in, in our midst. Okay, so that's some of the historical position. The inspiration uh, for the book is that growing up here in the United States, uh, New York in particular, with journeys to New Jersey, don't get me wrong, right? um, the, the experiences that I have had um, have always been somewhat schizophrenic when it comes to issues of race within the Latino community. And what I mean by schizophrenic is that um, 
at the very same time that so many of our um, population members, I've been chastised tonight to say community members because you know, to talk about community is something that people actively seek out. And so that's not necessarily the case from any kind of population. Population is descriptive, community is proscriptive. But in any case, um, so with, among, within the Latino population, uh, there is a stance, right, that we do not have discrimination, or at least not like Los Americanos, North Americans. We are enlightened. We are above that. Uh, we don't have those black versus white um, problems uh, because we are all racially mixed. Right? Some of us may, must, might, might look lighter. Some of us might look darker, but all of us right, are a um, mixed race hue. And so the, we don't, we, we can't see color. We don't see race, right? So there's that. The schizophrenia steps in at the very same time that um, there is this sort of set of rhetorics, right, about how our mixed race backgrounds culturally or racially immunize us, uh, if you will, uh, from being racist. Uh, there's all this anti-Black language and sentiment and action right, uh, that Latinos take, right? So there's, you know, the polar opposites here, both being sort of a racial utopia and, you know, part of the racial hell, right? Uh, that is our hierarchical society and societies you know, across the globe. So seeing that schizophrenia was always something that I thought was problematic growing up, but the impetus for the book was when I started to see some of that surface in anti-discrimination law cases here in the United States and in Puerto Rico itself. Um, but let's focus on the ones here in the uh, contiguous United States. And what was I seeing there? Latinos, Afro-Latinos, the in a court case, uh, let's say an Afro-Latino, I'll give you various examples, I would come forward and say, I've been discriminated in the workplace. Right? I was deprived of salary increase. I was deprived of promotion. Uh, and it was because of my race. The people who did this to me, my supervisor, my employer, the representatives of the employer, et cetera, were all white Hispanics. And what can happen, unfortunately, not in all cases, but far too many for me to sort of dismiss as aberrational, um, were judges and sometimes juries, if, these, if this went before juries, that would view the defense of, but I can't be racist, I'm Latino. Uh, as if that were something that was already codified, right? Um, by a legislature or brought into our jurisprudence with case law uh, decision-making, which neither of which is accurate. Right? It's not the law. <laughs> uh, that one's own demography immuna, uh, insulates you from any challenge or inquiry, just even inquiry as to whether or not the facts support that you have committed an act of discrimination. Uh, and so when I started to see uh, anti-discrimination law cases like that, where this pseudo made up defense uh, is give, being given legs by both judges and juries, that's where I thought, no, 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 I, I, I got to step in here um, and see, you know, what can the power of the pen do? Uh, and so what I do in the book is I look at all the spaces in which anti-discrimination law speaks, the workplace, housing markets public accommodations, education, the criminal justice system, right? I look at each of these in turn in each chapter uh, to illuminate how is it right, that Latinos are active agents uh, in discrimination um, against not just Afro-Latinos, but other people of African ancestry. So that is to say African-Americans, people from Africa itself, African immigrants, the West Indies and the like. And that was very purposeful. Um, because I have found over the years and, you know, being engaged in this research for quite some time, uh, that when I bring up these issues with regards to Afro-Latinos, I'm told, no, 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 that's not the same thing. Our discrimination is different, or we're people of color, so we can be prejudiced, but we can't be racist because we don't have systemic power, right? So th there are these sort of built-in justifications, um, which don't bear uh, accurately on the ways in which in a segregated society, uh, while there are certainly sort of cast orders right, within the labor market, for instance, segregation also means that people of color, I'll be very specific here, Latinos, have a disproportionate power over other Latinos because we can't get work from other employers. Right? So many of us cannot. Uh, and so we rely 
on Latino networks, right? Uh, or other people of color networks. So if there is a secondary caste system happening within right, the Latino people of color networks, that is a further subordination that really can't just be simply excused with the idea, oh, it's not systemic power. Right? It's a form of systemic power that can be hmm, particularly harmful when that's your only escape valve right, from the overarching white supremacist societies. Um, so there's that built-in excuse when it comes to looking at Afro-Latinos. When I would look at uh, discussions of Latino biases against African-Americans, there the excuse would be, oh, well, it is cultural misunderstanding. It's not truly discrimination, et cetera. And more of the same with regards to other people from the African diaspora. But when you bring all these, all these populations together to examine what might be some of the trends and parallels, it becomes unmistakable that there is a pattern and the pattern is anti-Blackness. And so the book brings all these people together. I look at all these different spheres, um, not to say that anti-discrimination law is problematic. That's another conversation I'm happy to have, but that's not the agenda of the book. The agenda of the book is to say that the anti-discrimination law that we do have, that does work when it's properly applied, right? you know, when a judge and a jury are, are um, invested in applying it properly, um, that the anti-discrimination law that we do have isn't being enforced when it comes, or at least not fully, when it comes to the Latino body, right? When it comes to the Latino who is accused, if you will, of anti-discrimination, they're given this off-ramp from any further inquiry. And so I'm not suggesting every case that's brought is meritorious, but what I am saying that all cases that are brought merit and warrant a full inquiry and examination like any other anti-discrimination case. Right? Um, and it should not be an excuse right, that gets you out from any further kind of investigation judicially. Um, so the, I look at, you know, where does the uh, evidence display itself right, with regards to um, anti-Blackness in all these various spheres? Um, I use the case law in many ways to disrupt the, the silencing and the taboo uh, with regards to these topics. Uh, regarding anti-Blackness within uh, the Latino community. Um, it, for those who are curious, you know, why do I say Latino? It's just because I'm old and that's just what pops out of my mouth. But um, when I'm with young people and they school me, I, I'm happy to use the A or the X or the I and the slash and the O or the ampersand. I've lived through it all. Uh, so, and all of them are fine with me and I welcome them all. Um, it's just the Spanish speaking mouth kind of defaults to the O um, unintentionally. In any case, so that is sort of some of the inspiration for the book and how the book lays itself out. Now, um, one place in which I think it is very important to sort of like bring all this to bear, like, you know, some people say, okay, well, this is all very interesting. Now, what do we do about it? You know, how do we come together? Well, of course, one, full circle, racial literacy matters, right? Um, but let me explain to you exactly how, in one concrete case, racial literacy matters that I'm involved in right now and that I want to invite you all <laughs> to be part of the struggle. Um, and that's with regards to census taking. Uh, right now, up until this Thursday, really, let's call it Wednesday so that nobody loses sight of the deadline. This Wednesday is the deadline. Let me tell you what the deadline is all about. The Office of Management and Budget uh, at the federal government, uh, they're the ones who dictate what our data collection forms look like. The one most people often see is the census form uh, every 10 years. But, you know, every time you like apply for some grant or you apply to uh, do something with the Department of Education, right, wherever the government is, um, you will encounter a form asking you who you are, et cetera. And the reason for the question about your ethnicity, about your race, is to be able to have data, to, uh, population statistics, to compare to patterns of possible exclusion in the workplace, in the allocation of mortgages, right? You know, all the places in which there are public goods right, that are supposed to be uh, delegated in ways or opened up in ways that are free of bias and discrimination, population statistics assist us in being able to say, ah, this employer who says in the city of Newark that they can't find a single uh, Afro-Latino to be a janitor compared to the numbers of Afro-Latinos in the city of Newark, if you compared those two things and you saw an employer who employed 0% in a city in which I'm making up a number, let's say they constitute 
60%. Again, I'm making up a number here. Um, that means right, that even without having anti-Black, anti-Latino a sentiment being expressed verbally, because you know, the bigots are very sophisticated these days, right? Um, and so they don't always announce themselves. Some do, but not all, right? And so what do we need is indirect evidence. What kind of indirect evidence we have? It is not mere chance. A statistician who we bring in as an expert witness right, uh, in an anti-discrimination law case, a statistician would be quick to let you know that that is not by mere chance, that there is actually a dynamic here that is causally occurring, right? And that would then open the door to say the causation is discrimination because absent a meritorious reason, oh, all these Afro-Latinos don't know how to pick up a broom. I'm making this up again, right? You know, um, well, if that were fact and you could prove it, uh, that would mean, well, okay, you know, they, they're not equipped to be uh, janitors. And so that's why they've been excluded. But you see what I'm saying here? Popula population statistics matter. So back to what's going on with the Wednesday deadline. Office of Management and Budget is uh, revising the way in which the race question gets asked. Some of you have probably already heard about how for the very first time, the Office of Management and Budget is going to include a MENA category, Middle Eastern, North African, like finally, right? You know, as opposed to uh, viewing people who have uh, Egyptian ancestry, uh, a Saudi ancestry, et cetera, as if right, they, uh, they did not experience a differentiation vis-a-vis -vis those who in the U.S. are categorized as white, right, um, is not attuned to right, all the things that uh, uh, Professor Sahad, you know, details in her book, The Racial Muslim, and so many others. Right? Okay, so that's a good thing, right, that they're adding the MENA category, because otherwise, before this, the way in which people are racialized as inherently a Muslim terrorist doesn't get counted. Where we don't get to see the spaces in which the, those people stereotyped that way are excluded from public goods based on that in comparison to population statistics. So that's a good kind of reform. Here's the reform that's bad <laughs> as far as Afro-Latinos are thinking. Right? right now, the um, Office of Management Budget has got on the proposal to have Latino be moved away from an ethnic origin question into one single question whereby you could say, what race, and here they're writing down the, the STEM questions, what race or ethnicity? It's like You choose whatever you wanna put in here. <laughs> um, are you white, black, Nina, Latino, Asian, indigenous? Right? As if to say mutually exclusive boxes. And only if you have parents of different races. So I mean, when you see a question like that, you think to yourself, okay, most people are one box. I may be more than one box if my parents, if I'm a biracial child or what have you, right? Um, so that's the way the boxes are being presently set up. What this completely erases is that Afro-Latinos are not children of interracial intimacy. I mean, not at least not immediately directly, right? We are our own thing. We are an ethnicity with a racial identity, just as um, Brazilians, right? who come from the south of Brazil right, and settle here in Newark and other places, who are Asian right, because of the huge Asian population within the south of Brazil. Right? They are both ethnically Brazilian. Some might say Latino, some don't, but that's a different conversation. Right? So they are ethnically Brazilian or Brazil right? and Asian by race, by phenotype. Right? Uh, so that gets a race by the way in which the Office of Management and Budget presently has their proposal. I am part of a coalition that brings together all this research that I'm talking to you about today that is um, uh, to laid out for you in the stories of discrimination uh, uh, within the book, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino and Anti-Black Bias. We're bringing together all that research and that of others uh, to protest <laughs> what the Office of Management and Budget is doing with the Latino category. Uh, and, oh, wonderful, five minutes so I can wrap this up. Fantastic. Uh, so here is where so we see the rubber hits the mat. If we really want to be in coalition, right, if Latinos who represent, you know, uh, in our civil rights organizations are saying to, that they represent all of us, you don't represent, represent all of us if you don't attend to the ways in which our intersectional identities within the population are not being well attended. Right? So right now, putting Latino next to other boxes but not specifying how race and ethnicity are distinctive and are distinctive ways of being other, they both matter, but they both should be measured, right? So 
let me break it back with one more example because I like to be very concrete. When you have, for instance, a white Latino employer, whether they identify as white or whatever, right? Meaning, but they visually look white and they only hire other Latinos who similarly look light. And an Afro Latino applicant says, I'm qualified to do this job. There was an opening and my, my application was rejected along with all other Afro Latinos. And I think it's because of race. Without the data, without data that looks both at ethnicity and race together for the Afro Latino, that is a white Latino employer who could say, I'm not racist, I do hire Latinos, right? With no way to compare the way in which that huge pan-ethnic umbrella is veiling patterns of other forms of exclusion based on racial appearance. Right? So um, in the website, www .latino is not a race info. <laughs> if I can, I'll try it, I'll, I'll put it into the chat box. Uh, but Latino is not a race info. Go there and you will get all you know, more detailed information if you choose. We have links to resources, but we also have links to sample comment letters that you can put into the Office of Management and Budget to let them know what you think. I mean, you could go in there to let them know, yay, I like the MENA category. Right? You could say, I like the MENA category, but I don't like what you're doing with Latinos. You can say whatever you like. Um, if you don't have a pre-formulated thought about that, you can copy and paste our suggested comments. <laughs> this is about politics, y'all, okay? So we have some suggested language. It'll take you five seconds. You go to latinoisnotarace.info, you'll see the link for how to take action. You can put in your own comment right there, or you can put in the sample, uh, the copy and paste, right? And that'll be a, a way to be part of, a, you know, true meaningful coalition politics, uh, where we think not only of how our creamy layer, right, um, is, is othered and, and address their needs, um, but also how all of us are othered across both race and ethnicity. Um, so I think maybe that's a good place to sort of put a pause, see if there are any questions. Um, if people, if I beat them into silence, um, I'm happy to come up with some other um, thoughts. I wrote a whole book, y'all, so I got plenty to say. Um, but <laughs> let me put a pause there for a second. Let me see if, if I'm able to use the chat box to add in. Uh, some of that information. Thank you so much, Professor Tanya Hernandez. Um, as usual, you are informative, charismatic, um, and provocative. Um, I wish I I wish I had had law professors like you uh, when I was when I was in law school. So your students are very lucky to have you, and I will have to I can't I can't miss the opportunity to say we miss you at Rutgers Law. Um, so I have a couple questions just to get the conversation started. And while I do that, I encourage people in the audience to use the Q&A function on Zoom uh, to pose their questions. And you, you probably get this question often, uh, which is, what is the difference between colorism and racism? Right? Especially when you're talking about anti-Black bias among the diverse Latino, Latina, Latinx commu communities, populations, uh, but it would be really helpful for, for you to explain that to us because oftentimes people tend to confuse those two. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the thing, both are very powerful vectors, right? But racism includes colorism. Colorism is not big enough. And let me explain to you why I think that to be the case. Right? Colorism is all about the ways in which your skin shade mediate your access. Uh, and there's lots of empirical do documentation that shows the ways in which not only Latin America, but the United States and many other locations that we have pigmentocracies. That is to say, those with lighter skin shades of all, for all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and those with darker shades are arrayed differently right, in access to jobs, housing markets, Etc. Right? So that's all about colorism. Right? Racism, though, is bigger than colorism. Why? Because racism is also about the ways in which, regardless of your phenotype, regardless of your skin shape, um, if your hair texture is of a particular texture, 
if your lips are a particular size, if your nose is a particular width, and you experience exclusion because it's viewed as too African, that's not about your skin shape. You could be very light. I mean, in point of fact, in the book, I spent a significant amount of time detailing how these dynamics play themselves out within the family. Because within the Latino family, as I like to say, is the scene of the crime. And, you know, that's where we get taught all the logics or illogics of racism. Uh, and there we have a whole language. Right? And some people say, oh, yeah, y'all don't just use black and white. You get all these names for different skin shades as if that were an indicator of how evolved we are, that we see, we see so many skin shades. But what gets missed you know, from that um, hope right, uh, for a happy story uh, or spin on that fact is that all the different labels array themselves along a hierarchical ladder. That is to say, it's not innocuous. And su such that we have a word, right, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, for people who are very light, right? So meaning they could look like they just stepped out of Sweden, uh, you know, or Norway or what have you, and not one of the many people of color who have now become Nor Norwegian and Swedish, right? And yet we would call them not white. We would say they're not really white because there's the texture of their hair is too tightly coiled. Their nose is too wide. Their lips are too big. It's about things that we racialize right? beyond skin color that racism incorporates, that, your, that the visible aspects of your ancestry besides color are also evident. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about this is that another reason why I don't like to just simply collapse colorism uh, into the conversation about racism, although don't get me wrong, there is horrible work that is being done um, along color lines, so much so actually, and I, when I uncovered this statistic, I was really kind of, my mind was blown away, um, is that the disparity right, between like, the highest paid and the lowest paid with um, a, a, a people, we often tend to think of this as white versus black. Right? White American, African American, we think of that disparity as huge as far as a potential for wealth, let alone salary. Okay, the number of, the, the, the measure of disparity though is greater, greater than the white versus black within Blackness and within Latinidad. That is to say, the lightest versus the darkest of us within each of those two groups has more disparity than there is between white versus black. That is to say, skin color is doing something very problematic. And it's not just about the internal uh, pathologies that we have within our, or our populations, uh, brown paper bag texts and the like. You don't have that kind of disparity within a labor market, for example, if white Anglo English speaking people are not also part of doing color. I mean, we may not talk color in the United States, but we do color. Okay, so uh, that's just me conceding that yes, colorism is powerful, but one of the reasons why I don't like to only speak about these things as if they were only about colorism is because people get too comfortable there. Because people tend to think that colorism is only about the interpersonal dynamic uh, and intimacy. That is to say, preferences about what you think is beautiful, preferences about who you think is handsome, preferences about who you want to date or to marry, as if that were innocuous right? um, and not part of systemic discrimination. And because people are a little too comfortable there, I like to be a little bit more disruptive, uh, get to the heart of the matter. And so I, talk, I want to talk about all of it under um, with the language of racism. Yeah, those are, I mean, those are tough issues um, to, to address when you're dealing both with intergroup racism, bias, discrimination, and the way in which it infects the intragroup dynamics. And so that leads me to my second question. And again, I encourage the audience to ask questions using the Zoom uh, Q&A, uh, which is, could you explain kind of to the audience and, and to me how the, your analysis connects back to Spain's colonial history and the perpetuation of European supremacy, which now tends to be called white supremacy. But where is, you know, how do we understand that history to understand the present problems that you're so astutely uh, examining? 
They're both relevant and also complicating. So let me address both. <clears throat> They're relevant in the sense that um, for those Latinos um, for which the United States didn't land on them, that's what I, how I like to refer to Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, like, you know, people didn't migrate, the United States migrated onto them, right? <laughs> Through colonialism and what have you. So, but apart from that, right? Other Latinos who enter into the United States, right? We, we don't enter in with a racial blank slate. We enter in already informed by the racial logics of our uh, home countries, right? Or our home ancestries. If we've been here for multiple generations and have been taught by our own grandparents, parents, et cetera. So that, you know, if we want to say that culture is our food, our language, our dance, our art, then it would be ridiculous to try to say, but the one thing that isn't our culture is our, our racial pathologies. Uh -uh. You want to call any of these things culture? You got to, it, it's all of it, right? So, <laughs> so the spices come along with, right, the spicy language with regards to racial animosity, right? So all that is a package deal. The way in which uh, Spain, uh, along with England, were like, you know, the forefathers <laughs> of white supremacy is relevant. Um, however, we continued in Latin America and the Caribbean, all the same colonial racist logics after the Spaniards were gone, right? Uh, so that the, uh, ra the regulation of race, as I say, continued long after abolition, it continued long after liberation, uh, and separation from the Spanish colonizers or in the Brazilian context, the, the Portuguese. Uh, and so that is relevant, but it is, um, how should I put this? It's not just about the colonizers. It's also about the way in which we continued it um, in ways that served right, those who are at the type of the racial higher, the elites. Now, why is it not the only thing that's being, because uh, I said it was sort of yes and no, right? and here's the part of that no. The no part of this um, is that when Latinos are racialized as Latinos right, in the United States, right, you know, I mean, when they're othered based on um, their ethnic background, there is another complicated factor because those who were white in Argentina enter the United States, live here a couple of generations or whatever, right? And their kids right, are now experiencing not being viewed as white in the following sense. Not uh, their face may still look white, but once uh, folks who have biases and have stereotypes about those who are Latino hear the last name, hear the Spanish language, right? there's a way in which that, that differentiates that formally, that family that was formerly just white and had white privilege within Argentina. Why is that complicated? Because, and it factors into, back to the census, my census conversation. Why? Because these are the very Latinos who are like, well, wait a minute. I'm not like white, white, like the Americans, right? Um, but I don't see myself right, on the form. And they're the ones who want to be able to just say, I'm Latino, end of story. <laughs> and I don't want to talk, I don't want to talk about nothing more. Um, and that's disingenuous, right? Uh, and so there is the way in which racial identity is uh, further complicated by being transplanted here into the United States and the racial context. It doesn't lessen the white versus black binary. It means that we have multiple black white binaries happening simultaneously and we need to attend to them all. Right? So meaning it is just as important to look at the ways in which Latinos experience exclusion and stereotyping and violence, right? Simply by being Latino, right? That it's an ethnic identity, but there's a lot of exclusion that is happening. It is just important to be attentive to that as it is to be attentive one little fa little factoid to share with you. Right? We always think Latinos care about immigration. However, when busloads of immigrants were being transported from where they've been dumped in Texas, for instance, um, and being brought up to uh, New York and other uh, northern locations, it was Latino pro-immigrant, if you will, organizations that were seeking to help who were the ones who excluded Black immigrants. Why? because they didn't view them as part of their network of empathy. So that the concern with immigration wasn't just the concern with immigration, it was a concern with immigration of light-skinned looking Latinos. That's something that we need to stop trying to ignore and act as if that isn't problematic. Um, and so that's sort of the way in which all this stuff comes together, um, however complicated. 
And the thing is this, people will say, oh, well, it's too much complications. No, people underestimate the ways in which um, folks living in the real world and keeping their eyes open are actually attentive to all this. All I'm trying to do is to provide them with a language and a grammar for articulating what they already know and see. And this is why when I do this sort of like, a, um, not in academic circles, um, but I talk about the book um, in community groups, and, you know, public bookstores, public libraries, or what have you. It's just a bunch of amen courses, right? You know, the people who, uh, you know, are not academics, but they're seeing this stuff and they just want to say thank you right, for having now an architecture for being able uh, to bring up the claims that they want to bring. Thank you so much, Professor Hernandez. This has been um, informative, timely, and um, essential conversation. Uh, again, for anyone who has not purchased her book, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Anti-Latino, excuse me, Anti-Black uh, Bias in Latino Community and the Struggle for Justice, please do so um, as soon as possible. Uh, and if you have any closing comments, uh, I'll give you the floor for a, a couple minutes before we end. Well, I just want to thank the audience for coming. I, I, I really appreciate being able to share these ideas. I know that oftentimes it can be um, a bit scary, right, to be doing this work of looking at within the population um, because we're afraid that then this idea of collective just falls apart in and of, in of itself. Um, but the point is this, if we're not actually being attentive to how the collective is not a true social justice, all encompassing and caring um, agenda, then we aren't really part of a collective, right? We're just part of, um, in name only, um, some a leadership that you know is serving its own interests and not taking care of all of us. Uh, so um, I, I wanna say how much I appreciate those who sort of come on the journey with me um, during our conversation today to think a little bit more deeply about these issues and what we can do about them. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Hernandez. And once again, to the audience, please follow us on csrr.rutgers.edu, social media at RUCSRR or Instagram at Rutgers CSRR. Next year, we will be having uh, our annual lecture series again, and it will involve addressing gender and race. So stay tuned for some of the excellent speakers that we have lined up. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you again, Professor Hernandez. Thank you to the audience. And um, best of luck to everyone who's ending the semester and have a wonderful summer. Ma salama. <laughs>